And uh, I'm really excited to welcome our first speaker. Dr. Marsh is not on yet, I don't believe, but we'll be, I'm sure he'll be joining us shortly. But our first speaker is Dr. Brian Jen Jensen. Uh, Dr. Jensen is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a practicing primary care pediatrician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's a faculty member at Policy Lab and at the Center for Pediatric Clinical Effectiveness at CHOP and he's the medical director of value-based care for CHOP's care network. He's board certified in pediatrics and clinical informatics. From 2014 to 16, he was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, and he earned his Master of Science in Health Policy Research. Um, Dr. Jensen, the webinar is yours. And I'll switch from my Lego to my actual face. So good morning, everyone. <laughs> Let me add my, I'll share my screen my PowerPoints, and I'll get into my full view here. And then if camera test, if you can just give me the thumbs up, does that look like it's coming across appropriately? Great. All right, so um, we're gonna take just a half hour to give you kind of a high level review of these core topics, the epidemiology of adolescents and marijuana use, the health effects, and then the clinical and policy approaches. Uh, always important to me sort of talk. So I come to this research initially as a tobacco control research expert, and I've been pulled into more marijuana policy. I have no relevant conflict of interest to disclose. And what I mean specifically is I have no ownership in tobacco, marijuana, and or e-cigarette companies. An important thing, whenever you're looking to the source of particular content to make sure you understand who's funding that content. For our main objectives for our 30 minutes for our talk, uh, describe the trends in adolescent marijuana use, recognize the health effects associated with marijuana use, and then develop and talk about harm reduction strategies regarding marijuana that can be used in clinical and community and policy settings with adolescents and young adults. First off, where you can go for more information. This was a great recent report by the formerly referred to as Institute of Medicine, now referred to as the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And it gives a nice real uh, review of the health effects, the health harms and the health benefits of cannabis and cannabinoids. I wouldn't recommend reading the whole report unless you want to, but certainly reading the executive summary to give you a good sense of where we are in terms of the latest evidence. Oops, next one. There we go. All right, so we're gonna, these are the, gonna, the four areas we're gonna talk about. The patterns of marijuana use among adolescents, what we know about the health effects, some of the research gaps and ongoing questions, and then clinical and policy approaches, really what I refer to as a harm reduction framework. Uh, Dr. Marsh will go into some more of these different terms, but in terms of some definitions and comparisons, uh, cannabis refers to three species of hemp, sativa, indica, ruderalis. Marijuana is much more of a generic term. I'm not going to go be going into this talk as much into CBD, the cannabidiol. These are the component parts of marijuana that differ in their degree of potential effectiveness and psychoactivity. For this talk, I'll be talking more about THC, uh, the tetrahydrocannabinol, that psychoactive component of marijuana, which has the potential for disordered use and abuse. First off, let's talk about historical marijuana trends, what we know over the last 40 years. There are three major groups that have been tracking marijuana use among adolescents, and I'm highlighting one of them, the monitoring the future data. And what you see on the slide, just to get you kind of oriented, uh, on this particular graph, you're seeing kind of all the way back to 1975 up until the most recent data for last year. And then the color coding, eighth grade is green, 10th grade is blue, 12th grade is red. And this shows you percentage of high school students who reported use in the past 12 months. And what we see is the data suggests that there's been a real plateauing uh, over the last now 20 years. And even with the rise of legal marijuana over the last 10 years, a real plateauing hovering around by the time individuals are seniors, about 35% of them have tried marijuana in the past 12 months. Let's focus in a little more closely though. Let's look at some of the shifting patterns of use. So this, hot, this is the same sort of data focused in though and viewed a little differently. On the right hand side is still past marijuana use, citing what I just kind of reported for the last three years. But we are seeing shifting patterns. So it really hasn't shifted in terms of past year use hasn't shifted that much in current use, which is defined as kind of regular use on a monthly level. We are seeing shifting patterns in daily marijuana use, uh, especially among lower grades, among eighth and 10th graders. A small but clear kind of increase over the last two years, 
And what's fueled that? And so this talk is not about e-cigarettes because that's a whole other topic, but we could not not talk about it as it relates to marijuana. This slide is showing you from a different repository from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, the dramatic rise of e-cigarette use over the last 10 years. So much so that now the latest data, and it still seems to be this case uh, through the COVID pandemic, more than one in four high school students report current e-cigarette use. That's a, again, a different topic, but it's related to marijuana use because when we look at the shift in mode of delivery of marijuana, we are seeing a clear increase in THC vaping that has climbed significantly over the last couple of years. This again is the monitoring the future data with the color coding as described at the bottom there for eighth, 10th and 12th graders. We are seeing past month use, which is usually a marker of current use, at least as it comes from tobacco. We're seeing a rise in that of THC for especially prominently for 10th and 12th graders. And then daily THC vaping, we're seeing this dramatic increase over the last couple of years. We can't not, when we talk about epidemiology, we have to talk about um, the shifting status, uh, legal status of marijuana. So this is moving, this is the most recent data, and I'm taking it from a website that I highlight there. You can find different sources for this. I just like the color coding of this one. So this shows you that in the United States, 11 states plus the District of Columbia, DC, have legalized recreational use, and 33 states plus DC have legalized medicinal use. And these are, um, there's data suggesting for the next four years, this will continue to shift, but right now this is the current state. So when we talk about epidemiology and the shifting power patterns of legality, there's another question that comes up. Are there changing patterns of teen use with legalization? And what we've seen from a variety of studies is an interesting conclusion in that the shifting legal status is not, not associated with increased teenage use. When we look at past 12 month use or current use, and that's been identified through multiple studies and multiple systematic reviews, mostly in the United States, but also in, in Europe. There is some data that suggests it actually may be associated, so legality, especially for recreational, may be associated with decreased teenage use. And the theories behind that is it might be more difficult to obtain. Licensed dispensaries require proof of age, so it gets it harder to get access to it. And some have joked, um, with some, maybe some truth behind it, though it hasn't been reported in the data, so more anecdotally, that as marijuana use has increased in the adult population, especially the population 40 to 60, teenagers say, I don't wanna do something that my parents are potentially doing. But I think what we really see is that this may be associated with decreased use more because it becomes more difficult to obtain. But we have to, uh, we have to interpret this data with caution. We need to have ongoing surveillance, an important kind of uh, area that we need to continue to focus on. And we need to focus not just on the prevalence, but also the patterns of consumption. In smaller reports, for example, anecdotal reports too, we do see a slight increased risk in daily use among current users. So we're not seeing an increase in kind of any use or potentially current use, but among current users with legalization, we see an increased use pattern among current users. And to get to the other point about maybe decreased access driving this, same data for modern in the future, looking at the percent of high school students that report it's very, fairly easy or very easy to get marijuana, we are seeing over the last 10 years a decrease where high school students are reporting that it is becoming more difficult to potentially obtain marijuana. So that gives you a sense of the epidemiology. Let's talk more about what do we know about the health effects. First, let's talk about what we know and what we don't know. Again, I'm a tobacco control researcher where I started. There is significant conclusive evidence of the harms of tobacco, period. Tobacco use in any form, especially smoking it, causes disease, disability, and death, period. That's a fact. Smoking, Tobacco remains the leading preventable cause of disease and death in the United States. Even with all our concerns and everything that's happened that's sad and difficult and frustrating happening with COVID-19, smoking still causes more deaths right now than COVID is. It causes harm to users and non-users, and there's a long history of tobacco company manipulation, and specifically over the last 40 years, 60 years, targeting children. When it comes to marijuana, conclusive evidence is lacking. We have limited research into the short and long-term health effects. And the regulatory environment really limits the ability to capture surveillance data. 
because of what's happening at the federal level and the restrictions still labeling this as Schedule One substance, uh, many people don't want to report it because they're concerned about the potential judicial legal ramifications. So that also leads to a lot of issues around the definition of marijuana use itself and then consistency issues and how we evaluate what type of marijuana is used when we look at the health effects. And what I mean by that, stated another way, we know what a cigarette is and all the health impacts from smoking one cigarette. We, want, we know what a unit of alcohol is and all the related health harms from that unit of alcohol. We don't really have that uh, conclusively with marijuana. But we do have some things that we can kind of draw attention to. The first of all, let's, let's talk and take a step back talking about adolescent brain development. I'm gonna give kind of a, a broad overview of this and then Dr. Marsh might go into some more specific details from a neurologist's perspective. Uh, as a surprise to no one, uh, during adolescence, there is intense development in a variety of key brain regions. Specifically regions, areas of the brain that focus on motivation, cognition, general thinking, and impulsivity. Why is that? The idea is that it helps promote learning and preparation in, uh, for adaptation to adult roles. But with that, there's clear evidence that it confers a greater vulnerability to addiction. Before we hone in on marijuana, let's just talk about overall teen drug use and adult dependence. The data suggests from a variety of different resources that the risk of adult dependence based on teen drug use is inversely related to age. What I mean by that, if you start younger and frequent in your use, there seems to be a dramatically increased risk that you'll be have some sort of dependence as an adult. And for some reason, consistently, the data suggests that under 14 is that number, but it's not some dramatic cutoff to say that if you start at 15, you'll be fine. It's probably more a factor of what researchers define as age cohorts than any sort of specific thing necessarily related to the brain developing itself. And when you look at this data, this is I'm highlighting this next number from a couple different reports. When you look at adolescent use of a drug and then transitioning to adult dependence, if there's one thing that you get from this talk, uh, and this is again, uh, coming from a tobacco control perspective, regular nicotine users, and uh, the vast majority of them, if you're a regular nicotine user as a teenager becomes addicted to it and dependent as an adult. And what I'm showing here, don't worry so much about the numbers, but as the comparison between them. The next risk factor would be alcohol, then cocaine, and then marijuana does represent a risk, but it's much lower uh, than what nicotine represents. And nicotine is particularly frustrating and difficult because small infrequent use of it dramatically leads to current use. And then that current use dramatically leads to uh, adult dependence. And what's interesting, when I was younger, what was taught was that marijuana was a gateway drug. That's never actually been borne out in the data. I mean, that if you use marijuana, you'd be at increased risk for alcohol, cocaine, and tobacco. That's, that's not true. In fact, it seems that tobacco, and in particular nicotine in tobacco, is the gateway drug priming young brains to be addicted to other drugs. Again, not marijuana, but tobacco. Let's phone in a little bit more about adolescent use of marijuana. So marijuana use is associated with the following issues. Diminished scholastic achievement, lower degree obtainment, increased addiction risk, early onset psychosis, and there seems to be this relationship between receiving a marijuana use as a teenager and receiving a diagnosis of a significant mental health condition, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. The difficulty is these studies are few and they tend to focus on looking at teenage who's, who use. There hasn't been a randomized control trial comparing giving someone one and giving someone kind of a placebo, not marijuana. There are significant ethical uh, concerns about taking that approach. But when we think about um, associations, studies that find associations, we have to ask ourselves, which way is the causal pathway? Meaning which way does, how, what's the actual relationship between X and Y? Does marijuana use increase these above risks or do youth who are at risk for the above, for those kind of different associations, do they seek out marijuana use? And based on the data, we can't actually answer that question so far. So these issues are associated with marijuana use, but we don't know if they necessarily cause one or the other. Let's focus on a couple more specific things. Let's look at marijuana use and mental health. Really, what's the kind of the, one of the strongest signals that we could potentially identify? And there's a question that's been recently posed. I'm highlighting a systematic review and a meta-analysis, and I'll go into more details about that, in which they ask the following question. Is adolescent cannabis use consumption associated with risk of depression, anxiety, and suicidality in young adulthood? 
And what they found is there is a slight increased risk of depression. There doesn't seem to be an increased risk of anxiety. And there does seem to be a moderate increased risk of suicide ideation and attempts. And what I'm highlighting here on the right hand side is what's called forest plots. I don't want us to get stuck in the weeds of this, but what this highlights is the studies and then the data showing the relationship between the effect. And if you look more carefully in the screen, you'll see a dashed line that represents the number well, one, in terms of your, your risk of something happening. If the data crosses over that, that shows there's not really an association between these two things. If it falls on the right side, it suggests that there is a relationship. And what you're seeing, especially for depression, the data is a little all over the place. And I'll close this section by pointing out, there seems to be an increased risk, a slight increased risk of depression with marijuana use as a teenager. When we look at those numbers, another way of saying it, a teenager who uses marijuana compared to a teenager that doesn't, they have a 1.4 times increased risk. They're 1.4 times more likely to have depression. Now let's just put that in context because when we, when we did these similar sort of studies over time related to cigarette use and the association that was so, so strong, we said it was causing lung cancer. So when we look at cigarette use and lung cancer, those numbers, these odd ratios were 10 to 40. So cigarettes cause lung cancer, meaning that cigarette use, a cigarette user compared to a non-user has a 10 to 40 times increased risk of developing lung cancer compared to someone who does not. When we look at this data, this suggests that a marijuana user at teen compared to one that does not has a 1.4 times. I'm getting a little in the weeds there, but just to help emphasize the different degree of the evidence there. Let's go further and talk about marijuana use and cognitive functioning. So these are two other systematic reviews that recently came out and they pose these questions. Is frequent or heavy cannabis use associated with deficits in adolescents and young adults? And what they found is, in these, these kind of looking at a whole variety of studies, I think they ultimately looked at 10 to 15, they found a small impact of questionable clinical importance on a couple of different domains of how people might think. What they also find though is if individuals, these teenagers and young adults abstain for more than 72 hours, it removes those deficits and they go back to baseline. Those deficits don't seem to persist. So that's interesting. And then there was another study that looked at a long-term study looking at teenage use and adult cognition. If you use a teenager, what happens to your adult functioning? It was a 25 year long term study. And they found that there was an association, a small association with slightly worse verbal memory, but nothing else in terms of cognition, no other domains were affected. And so maybe I'm adding myself in terms of my age, but just a, uh, an image from uh, the, the, a stoner stereotype that you might see that was popularized by Sean Penn may not actually be the case in terms of kind of frequent marijuana use and its impact on cognition. What about other health effects in terms of broad categories? We find that smoking cannabis is not associated with an increased risk of lung cancer, and there doesn't seem to be any real strong evidence that's associated with any other cancers besides a small but stable association with one type of testicular cancer. In terms of heart attack, stroke, and diabetes, there's some evidence that smoking cannabis, smoking marijuana, may trigger a heart attack. There's some evidence that suggests it's associated with an increased risk of stroke. But then interestingly, there seems to be associated with decreased risk of diabetes. So how do I interpret that? Usually that I would say is more research is needed because we're finding these results, small results, but they're, the, they're a little all over the place. Let's talk about other broad health effects. Respiratory disease, regular smoking of marijuana does seem to be associated with chronic bronchitis and worse cough and cold symptoms. If you stop using, those effects seem to go away. And there seems to be an unclear association with COPD, asthma, or worse lung function. In terms of immune system function, there doesn't seem to be a clear association between marijuana use and diseases related to systematic, systemic inflammation. Doesn't seem to be any sort of association between marijuana use and worsening of what we refer to as immunocompromising disease. Now let's go to other important areas. What about marijuana use and harms to others? And I think this is one of the, the main signals that we should kind of take from this evidence. There does seem to be a queer relationship, a causal relationship between marijuana use and impaired driving performance. The driving under the influence of cannabis, referred to now as a DUIC, is associated with significant increased accident risk. Uh, interestingly, alcohol represents a much worse risk compared to marijuana, 
but the combination of the two of them is worse than either alone. In terms of pediatric ingestions, we've seen a dramatic rise of increased unintentional cannabis overdose among children, especially in states that first legalized legal marijuana. Thankfully, there's been no known deaths, but I'm just highlighting on the right-hand side with this figure, uh, the light blue is Colorado, the dark blue is the rest of the United States, and we see this dramatic rise in um, overdose marijuana calls to poison control center uh, populations, uh, sorry, control, poison control center hotlines um, with legalization of marijuana in Colorado. What about other harms to others? There seems to be queer risk of uh, marijuana use and secondhand smoke exposure issues. So other than nicotine and the cannabinoids, tobacco and marijuana smoke are really similar. You know, smoke is a complex mix of chemicals, uh, ultrafine particles that hurt the lungs and gases. We're at the point where we can say there's no safe level of tobacco smoke exposure. There's no safe level of marijuana smoke exposure. And what about prenatal and infant exposure? In other words, either exposure to um, a developing baby or a baby. And the data suggests that cannabis smoking during pregnancy is associated with lower birth weight, which has a whole bunch of other complications from it. But the relationship with other pregnancy and childhood outcomes remains unclear. And that's really more of a factor where we haven't been able to potentially study that information. I want to close this section by we can't, as a pediatrician, I can't not talk about other harms that directly relate to not just immediate health effects, but also kind of the long term well being of an individual. And there are clear harms related to policing of marijuana. Every year, there are more than 400,000 youth that are arrested or put in jail for marijuana. And the majority of marijuana arrests in the United States are, for, are, are teens and young adults. It has significant lifelong complications and consequences, limiting and restricting ability to receive college loans. If you have even just a misdemeanor uh, related to marijuana use on your, um, on your track record, financial aid, housing, and certain kinds of jobs are all restricted. And there, it's very arbitrary um, and capricious in terms of who gets penalized for this. Small amounts of marijuana lead to significant penalties. Approximately 90% of arrests are for one ounce or less. So think about it like a Ziploc bag worth of marijuana or less. And state penalties range widely from a fine of only $100 to $5,000 and five years in prison. And I'm showing you when we look at kind of uh, drug arrests, the, the plurality of drug arrests in the United States are related to marijuana, which when we think about some states have it legal and others that don't, that is a completely kind of arbitrary uh, situation that we have right now. And it represents a failure of government policy. When we think about the war on drugs that was really kind of highlighted and really pressed forward in the 1970s, uh, arrests are, un the idea is that if you arrest people who use drugs, you can potentially decrease use is the theory behind this. And that theory has been disproven over and over again. Since 1980, there's been a dramatic increase in arrests for marijuana, but no corresponding decline in use. Also, there's been a dramatically worsening racial disparities related to use. What I highlight is black and white boys use marijuana at equal rates for the most part. Uh, but when you compare black youth to white youth, black youth are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana and, and receive much harsher penalties for the same crime. And what we care most about is helping people who have patterns of uh, problem drug use. The criminal justice system has no approach for substance use treatment, period. No kind of, me kind of major approach to this. So let's talk more about some of the research gaps and then we'll talk about kind of clinical and policy approaches. What we see in kind of broad broad terms is that we have, when it comes to marijuana, we have policy that's both ahead of and restricting the science. In terms of both prohibit, uh, the prohibition and kind of approval for clinical use, there's just a lot of low quality scientific evidence, anecdotal reports, testimonies, and public opinion around this. And we have a lot of restricted funding and limited reporting. And we have to be very careful in the study designs we use to draw conclusions. As I mentioned earlier in this talk, finding an association between two things does not, is not the same as saying X causes Y. And there are a lot of sources of potential errors in these studies. As I mentioned, there's a lot of inconsistent definitions of use. There's a lot of inconsistent definitions of marijuana content, and there's a lot of measurement issues. And what I mean by that last point is that when it's illegal, people don't want to report it. So they tend to underreport their actual use of something. So it makes it really hard to tease out the level of use associated with potential health harms or potential health benefits. So it becomes really hard to identify real harms or real benefits. Now I'll talk about a couple of key areas just to kind of get people intrigued by these topics. What we're seeing is in terms of questions, we are seeing a shifting mode of use. And this represents, this data looks at Colorado high school students um, with legalization. And we are seeing that of people who 
report past 30 day use, so current users. We're seeing fewer teens smoking and more teen, teens ingesting it, vape, uh, vaping it, or dabbing it. And it leads to a question I often get uh, for, as a pediatrician, as a, a marijuana tobacco control researcher, which mode potentially is associated with least harm? And pre some of the things I'm gonna talk about, pre the dramatic rise of vaping associated lung injuries, maybe if pressed, I might've said, well, vaping might be less harmful than smoking, but we really can't answer that right now. So I'm showing you on the left-hand side, uh, smoking versus vaping. The middle is uh, dabbing, which is like a concentrated form of THC. And then the right-hand side are all the different candies and forms of ingesting them. We really can't say that right now because we really haven't studied which of these might be potentially least harmful. I could say though, if you were to smoke marijuana at the same rates that you would potentially smoke tobacco, we would see a lot of those kind of significant harms associated with tobacco use like lung cancer. Now, before this, as I mentioned, I might have said that maybe vaping might have been, if pressed, potentially less harmful. But over the last year, we've seen a dramatic rise in this, this e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury evolving. Folks, this has not gone away, okay, with the rise of COVID. We are still seeing cases of this, and it's muddying the water in terms of what actually is happening to teenagers. So prior to COVID, uh, there were cases, there were more than 2,800 hospitalizations throughout the United States and uh, more than 60 deaths and rising. The vast majority of them have been teens and young adults. We have new data just reported from California, but this is still occurring and it's underreported. And these look like chemical injuries to the lungs that we used to see with industrial chemical workers back in the 1920s and 30s, people who worked with asbestos or, or other forms of chemicals. Just highlighting what this looks like. These are not normal lungs is what I'm highlighting in these images. Uh, what we know about Avali so far is that E-cigarettes are the only real connection, and it does seem that counterfeit THC might have been the most kind of reported individual brand, but that wasn't in the majority, that wasn't in all the cases. The vast majority are young individuals, and to show you some of the symptoms of how this is difficult to tease out with COVID right now, cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, nausea, GI symptoms, in fact, those are all things that COVID-19 causes, and so these are things that are also related to a volley. Uh, there also seem to be some other chemical samples that might be causing this, but it really seems to be this THC, counterfeit brands, e-cigarettes, potentially some other substances that are calling this. But we don't know a lot about this, and it takes time to identify and characterize new conditions. Many substances are still under investigation, and we have no idea what this, for children, for teenagers and adults who have these issues, who have a volley, we have no information about long-term prognosis. The vast majority of these kids that were hospitalized um, were admitted to intensive care units. Another area that we don't know enough about is in terms of the shifting pattern of frequency of use. This, what I'm showing you here in this figure, is past 12 uh, use, in terms of past 12 months, use among almost half a million respondents before and after recreational marijuana legalization in the United States. And I mentioned before, we haven't seen a real increase among different age groups in terms of past year use or current use, but we are seeing, and this is what's showing here, is that there's a possible increase in frequent use and cannabis use disorder among adults, and a possible increase in cannabis use to do a disorder small but real among teen users. So it's not so much that more teens are using with legalization, it's not so much more that teens are cur become current users more than uh, after than before legalization, but we are seeing that there might be increasing among those teens that we most worry about, those with cannabis use disorder, we're seeing a slight increase among that population, among teens and young adults. A final area would be the potency of marijuana consumed. We're seeing a uh, dramatic increase in the percent content of THC, and this is what I'm highlighted on the slide here, of uh, the potency in the United States and Europe during the last decade. And why that's potentially concerning is that high potency THC might have different sort of health effects than what we just, what I reported at the start of this talk. That data is based off data and THC use and marijuana use from the 70s and 80s and 90s and early 2000s. We are seeing as this rise of potency of THC, there doesn't seem to be a dramatic increase in these other things we talked about, alcohol, uh, depression, anxiety, other psychotic experiences, but there does seem to be an increase with higher potency THC, increased risk of cannabis use problems and anxiety. Just for time here, I wanna close with this final section. Let's talk about kind of a public health framework to how we approach marijuana, how we approach legalization and what's happening. And uh, people smarter than I 
and I would argue that this would be kind of the best approach to really kind of potentially minimize harm and explore potential benefits of this, which our other speaker would talk about. We would make it legal for adult use over the age of 21. And remember, just because it's legal doesn't mean we're endorsing its use. And then what you would do is leverage rigorous demand harm reduction framework. We would discourage adolescent use using evidence-based approaches. I'll talk about some of those. We would focus and counter the pro-marijuana business influence. We'd reduce exposure to secondhand marijuana smoke, aerosol vapor. We have enough evidence to say that there's no safe level of secondhand marijuana smoke. We'd regulate the availability. And then we'd really focus on helping those who are most at need, promoting services those with substance use disorder or problem use. And as I mentioned about the massive health effects and harms from the judicial side of marijuana policing, we would remove the judicial system from teenage use. We would decriminalize use for teenagers and really focus the punitive measures on the sellers, not the purchasers. And when we talk about kind of what works in the, the clinical space and how we can help push back teenagers and teenage use of it, let me start by talking about what doesn't work. Some in this audience might be kind of uh, either young enough or old enough to remember the D.A.R.E. campaign or the Just Say No campaign. Uh, those were really started in the 80s and still in many school systems use the D.A.R.E. campaign. That campaign through a variety of studies has been shown to be not effective. It's been very authoritarian. And in fact, those two campaigns may actually increase youth awareness of substances and experimentation. And the reason is it sparks curiosity and, and creates a false sense of use rates. A team might say that, wait, if I'm not using that, am I somehow abnormal? Am I not normal for not, be, for not using? So we know that these two things, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, they do not work. And I'm just highlighting one of the sources if you wanna read more about that. Now, what does work? We don't have evidence about marijuana messaging. Well, let's take some lessons from cigarettes. And if you haven't heard of this campaign, I encourage you to research it. The Truth Campaign has prevented hundreds of thousands of teens from starting to become cigarette smokers. And what they did was they focused on exposing the lies of the tobacco industry. This ad that's a little grainy on the top right of the screen shows you their body bag ad where they were in front of tobacco, exe tobacco executives in Manhattan uh, showing the number of deaths every day from the lies, from the, the pushing, from the manipulation of tobacco companies. And what they really focus on is harnessing youthful rebellion. Not using drugs is not about pleasing your parents. In fact, the argument is, you know, people your parents' age are trying to get you addicted to a substance for the rest of your life. Instead, not using drugs is pushing back against that and maximizing youth rebellion. And the marijuana marketing is already concerned. We're seeing a rising marketing budget. Uh, there's a variety of health claims with, with no health warnings. And it's not as bad as tobacco companies, but we're seeing appeals to youth. So MedMen, I encourage you to kind of look up, is I think my understanding is it's the, it's the largest national company right now and promoter of both THC and CBD products. And they claim they don't go after under 21 year olds, but they have these false claims around use of CBD to help with acne and breakouts. And clearly, while that certainly might appeal to young adults and older adults who get acne, it's clearly kind of focused on teenagers. So we need to kind of continue to, to watch out for this and push back. I'll close this talk by just talking about an approach to talking with teens and approach in clinical context. So it's so important for parents when you're talking with teens about modeling good behavior. And it's hard. I like this picture because it kind of shows a parent almost trying to lecture. That's not what I would encourage. It, you really want to kind of sit and get their perspective asking why they might use before suggesting why not. Uh, the health harms focusing on that may not get you far, but they have a role. Uh, in particular, what we see is use of marijuana during the teenage years does seem to have some potential mental health issues, particularly related to depression and suicidality. Share your concerns, especially around there are large companies now that are trying to manipulate teens to potentially engage in use. And then you can kind of reach out to us at the pediatrician level and we can engage further. Now I say that, what's the summary of evidence of how pediatricians approach this? Do we really have good evidence, for example, about screening, prevention, and treatment for cannabis use disorder? Well, the best practice is uh, clear evidence is lacking. Uh, it's unclear if screening translates into benefits, and it's unclear which treatments really work. But what we do know is if we kind of have a good relationship with our patients and we explore reasons for use and get a team thinking about why they're using, uh, there, that could play a role in helping them push back. For example, in our practice at CHOP, we screen for uh, marijuana use, alcohol use, tobacco use, 
And when we identify teens that report to us about marijuana use, we really focus on asking, well, what do you use? And for example, just the other day, I had a teenager who said, yeah, I'm using pretty regularly. Yeah, my mom's concerned about it. I said, why are you using? Well, you know, I, I'm really anxious and it's helping me kind of deal with my anxiety. And I said, oh, well, I'm not commenting on your individual use, but do you think there might be better ways to focus on your anxiety? And he said, yeah, you're right. And, and luckily, I'm proud to say that we got that teen into therapy and he reports to me that he's significantly cut down on his marijuana use. So that could be an approach. There is emerging evidence that primary care may play a role in preventing drug use, particularly early on, uh, teens focused at the age of 12, 13, 14. If we focus on screening, but really strong messaging, there may be a way to pre uh, prevent driving with an impaired driver, which is a huge risk factor uh, for disease and death. I'm sorry, for, for death. So where are, I'll close with, where are we in 2020 about these broad topics? Uh, conclusive evidence is lacking about uh, the short and long-term health effects. And we need systems of ongoing surveillance and that need to be kind of expanded and strengthened. Um, what so far we can say is that the available evidence identifies the health harms, there are some clear ones, but they're likely overstated in areas and the benefits are probably overstated. And the biggest thing, the biggest threat is there's clear short and long-term harms of criminalizing teenage use. So what we really need to focus on on the clinical side and the policy side is focus on harm reduction legalizing adult use as that continues, and prevent and decriminalize teenage use, and really focus on supporting individuals with substance use, cannabis use disorder. With that, just for our tight time, I'll stop, and I'll hand it back to, to Kim and, and to Tessa. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Jensen. Really appreciate that we do have uh, just one question, but folks, please do go ahead and start submitting questions now using either the chat box, oh, I see we have a couple now, uh, or the Q&A. So um, one question, doesn't the percentage of THC change the data on mental health issues? I guess we don't really know because there hasn't been enough research yet, is that correct? Yeah, that's the short answer. It's a great question, and I think it's something we need to focus on. But um, you know, pressing me is to say we really don't have great evidence. What, what evidence is there is concerning. If I can make an analogy, um, so again, I'm a tobacco control researcher as well. And we are seeing this risk of the, the data I reported about nicotine use as teenagers and then becoming dependent as an adult. That's based off of data from the 70s and 80s and 90s. Now we have these forms of nicotine that in the form particularly, for example, of Juul or Puff Bars, other products that deliver high nicotine concentrations, which seems to lead to much higher rates of dependence and much higher issues of mental health related issues. So it's reasonable to say there could be an association there. So we need to really watch out for that. So I'll close with a framework for how we protect teens and kind of really watch out for our, our vulnerable youth um, is to educate around that, but also potentially tax the THC content. That could be a way to really kind of raise awareness and potentially we know that teens, hopefully we're gonna be avoiding teenage use, but we know young adults also are really price sensitive. So if we potentially tax the higher THC content, we might be encouraging them to, if they're going to use, to use that lower THC content. It's a great question. Uh, hopefully we'll get more to come as more research emerges. Great. Okay, another question, and this is interesting. Um, they're asking about kind of the co-occurring disorders. So um, how would a person with a mental health condition and substance use disorder decide whether or not to focus on mental health recovery first or substance use first? And it's interesting to me, especially because last night we had a, an online program with two clinicians and two people, well, one person in recovery from um, substance use disorder. And our topic was navigating the maze of addiction and mental health. And we talked all about co-occurring disorders, dual diagnosis and so forth. And that is actually recorded and on our, web, on our website as well. So Tessa, if you would put that in the chat box, um, the maze uh, you know, link, then people can actually watch that presentation. But would you like to address that, Dr. Jensen? Yeah, it's a tough area because it's this chicken or egg sort of thing. And how do you best support people? Usually what we do in clinical practice, and then when I get uh, you know, parents who reach out and need some more support, um, is to, Kim, you, you, you highlighted the key points. Um, and what I would say is when we focus on these mental health related issues, like for depression, for example, um, there are three broad approaches that have an evidence base in how we deal with this. There's a role of therapy first and foremost, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy being the lead one, uh, clear evidence to support that. There's a potential role of pharmacotherapy, uh, especially for the more severe forms. 
but there's also structure. And we, I think we lose track of that sometimes as we deal with mental health issues. And I, I mean, even just, you know, structuring your day, getting up, taking the next best step. And what I try to help teens recognize is that your drug use in any form kind of throws off your structure. Uh, so really trying to, and not penalizing them, not trying to be punitive with them around it, but really trying to help them get off that to get on a path towards recovery. Because people might think that they're medicating themselves and helping, but the data doesn't really suggest that right now, especially for our uh, young adult population. So I'll close with what I try to help them realize and see and get them kind of with some more self-actualization is to recognize maybe there are better things to help them than using marijuana, for example, to help them cope with depression or anxiety. Right. Right. And this young man last night did say he was absolutely self-medicating for a lot of things that were either undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, you know, or just, you know, those kinds of challenges. Yeah. Right. Uh, so here we have, um, I currently work in a partial uh, hospitalization program. So many of the kids, 15 to 16-year-olds, year old, say things like, well, it's legal now and I'm getting my card soon and so forth. How do we explain to kids that even though it is becoming more legal for adults, uh, that it's not the answer for depressed or suicidal kids? Another great question. And I think um, let's talk about what we learned from things that don't work in the past and then think about how we can help teens in the future. So we have the strongest data around tobacco, like I mentioned briefly in the talk. And we know that like hammering kids over the head about the health harms and you know, what are you talking about doesn't work. That, that really doesn't work. Instead, you want to empower them to think through about, like I mentioned, the manipulation tactics, but also empowering teens. Teens are smart and help them realize, okay, I hear a lot of messaging around, well, it's, it's, it's safe. Marijuana use is safe. And I say, wait, safe compared to what? So what's the comparator? So, and I hear the same thing around e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes are safe. No, the messaging really should be safer doesn't mean safe, right? You really want to watch, you're a smart person and let's really help you. You're here and partial. You're here trying to get yourself on a better path. Let's build you up for the most success. I'm not commenting on the ethics of use. I'm, I'll say kudos for trying to do something, but let's connect, get you connected to things that are better, that we have more evidence that can help point you in the right direction. And I think using that soundbite, safer doesn't mean safe. I've, I've found there's messaging, there's data to support that messaging, but I also find in my clinical practice, there's a little bit of some aha moments that the teens have. Right. Great. Thank you. I think that answered another one of the questions that came up as well. Um, here is one. What is your opinion or con uh, concerns about the medication dispensing of medical marijuana? And I think that probably uh, Dr. Marsh is going to get into that a bit. Um, yeah, I'll let Dr. Marsh talk about, um, you know, in pediatrics. So we're pediatricians. Uh, let me give you kind of three points to that. Uh, in the adult world, so let's say over 21, over 25 of individuals who might seek this out, there might be a benefit, and there's some data that suggests there's a benefit for certain conditions uh, to help with, for example, chronic pain, um, spasticity related to certain conditions, maybe nausea related to oncologic treatments. Uh, but all these wide range of benefits, just uh, you know, be skeptical, right? That's the first thing for adult use. In pediatrics, um, and I don't mean to steal Dr. Marsh's thunder, He'll talk more about some of the things that particular roles that might be in certain cases for use. But just so you hear from us that, you know, CHOP pediatricians, primary care pediatricians, and I'm one of the medical directors in the care network, uh, we are not impressed by any data that's available because there is none around potential, you know, medicinal use for teenagers around uh, depression, anxiety. We are not prescribing that. That is not something we're endorsing right now. We are concerned. I want you to walk away. I'm concerned about the the punitive approach we take. We need to decriminalize and get the judicial system out of managing teenage use and, and policing, but that is not an endorsement that teens should be using. And so I think I mentioned that there was another question, and Kim, you can share my email if it's not there. Uh, if, you if you see practices that are supposedly prescribing medications, you know, CBD medications to teens or THC to teens, uh, shoot me a message, please, because that's not in line with our best practices of pediatricians. So sorry to get a little bit of a soapbox there, but I want to not, it's a good question. So I want to make sure that we can uh, potentially reach out and really find who those groups are that are doing an unevidence-based practice that potentially causes more harm than benefit. Right. And I think you're referring to the question that came in ahead of time about someone who works in peer support with young adults um, who've been prescribed medical marijuana for anxiety and depression. It's become, uh, they become dependent on it, but can't afford it most of the time. I mean, this is um, it just a, a very huge concern on, on a, a lot of levels here. So, um, yeah, and especially Kim, just to highlight, I know we're at a time here for my portion. Um, 
you know, we have treatments that we know work related to depression and anxiety. We, we have those. The big issue is we just don't use them enough. So let's not, let's not say that nothing works, right? Let's focus on the things that are evidence-based. Down the road, maybe we'll learn something else related to marijuana. But right now, what data is available suggests that that developing brain really shouldn't be exposed to it. Let's not muddy out the water for children who have these mental health conditions in which they're, they're either th th those conditions are made worse by marijuana use or they seek out marijuana use as medicating themselves. Let's really get them connected to treatments that we know work. Great. All right. Well, thank you so very much. We really appreciate it. We've had a couple people ask if you will be, um, if they'll have access to this PowerPoint. We are recording this, as we mentioned at the opening, um, and I think we will have a PDF version of this available on the site as well, right? Yes, happy to share. Great. Awesome. Thank you so very much. And I'm going to now, if you can unshare your, there we go, thank you. Uh, Dr. Marsh, thanks for being with us. I'm gonna get your introduction queued up here. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Eric Marsh is an attending pediatric neurologist at the Division of Neurology in Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. He specializes in diagnosing and treating children with developmental epilepsies, epilepsy, infantile spasm, and malformations of cortical development. Much of Dr. Marsh's research focuses on mutations in the ARX gene, which cause epilepsy and other diseases. He's also studying the clinical presentation of Rett syndrome, Drave syndrome, and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, CDKL5 syndrome, and related disorders, and is involved in a number of clinical trials for novel therapeutics. Uh, and now, Dr. Marsh, thanks so much for being here. Hello, thank you for having me. And yeah, as Kim said, I am a child neurologist who does a lot of work on basic mechanisms of epilepsy and novel therapeutics for epilepsy. And I kind of stumbled on working about CBD for epilepsy and medical marijuana for epilepsy, oh, six, seven years ago, um, when it started to become all the rage because of a patient uh, person in California. Um, just so I've been doing studies and have had some funding from a number of companies to do some of these studies. And I'll talk about some of the studies that we've done in this talk. But overall, I'm going to um, a little background about the plant and the biology, and then go into the clinical data um, of medical marijuana, and with a focus kind of on CBD for a lot of it, and then talk a little bit about state and prescribing or, or recommending marijuana as the state now uh, calls it, and then uh, conclude. So, you know, medical marijuana has been around for centuries, or marijuana has been around for centuries. People have thought about its use medically um, for a very long time. Um, so why has it gotten such a big uh, um, publicity and why is it in the forefront now? And you can sort of trace it to a single uh, case of a uh, girl with Dravet syndrome, which is a rare pediatric epilepsy, who was se seizing very frequently um, when they found a strain of medical marijuana that was high in CBD, very low in TB THC, and she became seizure-free on it. Um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta got, uh, uh, saw this video that they had posted online on YouTube about this, investigated it, and he um, aired in 2013 a documentary called Weed in which he reversed his opinion about medical marijuana. And he, like most physicians, was anti-medical marijuana, um, and thought that there was no reason to actually uh, research or investigate this, but based upon essentially this single case, so really good you know, um, evidence-based medicine here, he reversed his opinion on medical marijuana. And, and that really opened the floodgates because we, as a child neurologist, I started getting um, basically every one of my patients was, can I get medical marijuana? Can I get medical marijuana? And fortunately at the time, I, um, by a series of unusual events, ran into someone from this company, GW Pharma, who said, do you want to be involved in a study? So we started studying it. And because of that, I've learned an awful lot about medical marijuana over the years, which I'll share a little bit of that with you today. So what is cannabis? Um, what is medical marijuana? Well, it has a lot of names. I can actually spend the full half hour just going over um, its eponyms. Um, it is a plant that grows indigenously in Central and South Asia. Um, Cannabis sativa is the strain, which was a fiber plant, um, hemp plant used to make rope. And cannabis indica has more of a resin to it. And it was often the strain that was used to, um, for, rec for ritual and recreational uh, uses. But there are different strains of the same plant. Um, the major active ingredient in uh, the plant for recreational use is THC. 
Um, and this is the psychoactive mind altering aspect of the plant, as you all are aware of. And it modulates things such as eating, anxiety, learning, and memory. Typical marijuana is relatively high in THC and very low in CBD, but there are plants that have very high contents of THC that can be grown. And in marijuana, there are over 489 different identical uh, chemical constituents, uh, but the most distinctive class, the one that only really exists in the cannabis plant are these cannabinoids, of which there's at least 70, probably more that are known. Um, and there are other compounds in the plant, particularly the terpenes and some of the hydrocarbons, which think people think might also have um, medicinal properties to them. So one of the issues that I'll talk about at sort of at the end is that, is there a benefit from the whole plant because it's not just the CBD or the THC, but there's some of these other um, aspects in the plant that could have medicinal um, value to them. And then the component of um, marijuana that's getting a lot more pressed than the THC has been CBD or cannabidiol. Um, it seems to be the component that lowers seizures, and I'll go over that data. Um, the, the plant that um, started the whole epilepsy aspect of this, which was named Charlotte's Web by the Stanley Brothers, who gave um, Charlotte Figgy this plant, was very high in CBD and low in THC. It actually has no, I should change this, it has no psychoactive effects. So CBD has no psychoactive effects, and if anything, it actually blocks the effect of THC. Um, but the extraction process from a plant is critical. And the reason I bring this up is because dispensaries, which are under less regulation in how they grow and track their plant, you know, little differences in the weather can change how much of, a, of, a, of THC or CBD that gets extracted from the plant. I'm not going to go over this in any detail, but here's the biology. So it is a, um, a fatty acid, a um, cholesterol-like molecule that's in the plant's wall that gets broken down into either um, THC or CBD. And this um, enzyme gets pushed, uh, this enzyme gets pushed either into one of two pathways. And that's why the plant is either high in THC or high in CBD, because it generally goes one direction or the other. Um, and there's an awful lot known about the phytochemistry that exists uh, for this, and it's been studied for years now. Now, so how does THC work? Well, it works through the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system uh, has two main endocannabinoids, which are two arachidonylglycerol and anandamide. Um, and these are uh, fatty acids that are produced by um, lipids in the cell membrane. And there's a series of enzymes that are known to produce and metabolize these endocannabinoids. Um, and in the brain, they're particularly released by synapses, either presynaptically or postsynaptically, to modulate synaptic transmission. There are two main um, receptors for the cannabinoids. There's the CB1 receptor, which is um, abundant in the brain. Um, it's found in many different regions of the brain, um, and parts of the brain that you would expect would cause some of the symptoms that you see, such as changes in memory, um, the high motor uh, differences that are seen. Um, and it works by modulating electrical activity. So in and itself, it does not, um, it, it does not induce synaptic transmission, but it modulates the amount of neurotransmitters released or the amount of neurotransmitter receptor that gets activated uh, on the postsynaptic cells. Um, the other main uh, cannabinoid receptor are CB2 receptors, and these uh, work primarily on the immune system, and it's through CB2 receptors that some people think that mar medical marijuana can have anti-inflammatory effects, effects on uh, cancer biology and other um, uh, uses that it's been, that have been proposed. Um, the endogenous cannabinoids are produced by active activity of neurons. So the more active a neuron, the more likely it is to produce cannabinoids. Um, and like I said, the endogenous cannabinoids typically um, decreases neurotransmitter release, but in certain circumstances can increase neurotransmitter release. So THC has one effect. It binds with moderate affinity to um, CB1 receptors. It's only a partial agonist to the CB1 receptor. Um, and it, so THC alters synaptic transmission. And some of the synthetic cannabinoids actually have higher um, uh, um, specificity 
and sensitivity to the CB1 receptor. And it's through modulating direct synaptic transmission that it has its effect. Um, CBD, on the other hand, actually doesn't really bind to CB1 and CB2 receptors. It probably binds to CB2 receptors at moderate to low affinity, but it really doesn't bind CB1 receptors and actually may block CB1 receptors. So how does CBD work? Well, there's been a number of hypotheses put forth about the action of CBD. And the one that is getting the most um, basic science to back it up is actually this middle bullet point here um, in which that CBD alters calcium signaling by um, acting on GPR55. And so GPR55 is a membrane bound uh, protein that uh, activates a G-coupled um, uh, kinase. And it's through activation of GPR55 via either trip V channels or direct binding of CBD to GPR55 that um, it modulates neuronal activity. Um, and then through the CB2 receptor, it's thought to have these potential neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory effects. So that is a, a quick summary of the biology of CBD and how it's acting um, in the brain. And so now I'm gonna transition into general clinical info. And I think Dr. Jensen has touched on this part, but it's general effects of cannabis um, from cannabis that has high in THC has the effects that we know that gets one person um, high. And the health problems that it's associated with THC are not minimal. Um, so it is, as Dr. Jensen said, is, it's not a zero risk um, substance. There are risks of chronic, uh, of smoking uh, marijuana. So smoking marijuana has con um, respiratory problems. So you can develop chronic bronchitis. You can get large airway obstruction. You can develop pharyngitis. Um, though there is no uh, currently association with um, cancer, there is addiction. And Dr. Jensen talked about this, so I'm just going to kind of skip over it. And there is issues with motor vehicle uh, accidents too. So there is um, serious and significant health problems associated with um, the recreational use of medical marijuana. And um, two of the main issues that people think about when they talk about um, recreational use of medical marijuana are its long-term impacts. And so the two major issues are the long-term cognitive impacts of marijuana use. And there's been a couple long-term studies, large long-term studies have actually, that have demonstrated that there is um, impact on brain function. Now, these studies were done in um, people who started smoking as teenagers or adults, and that they were able to show that there was a um, decrease in verbal memory over years of use, um, and that there was decrease in IQ over years of use um, in these two studies. Now, these two studies have limitations in that these were following patients for other issues. It was voluntary um, uh, uh, admission of um, cannabis use and how much cannabis, it wasn't really measured. Um, but even with those caveats, there's clear long-term effects. And someone previous, you know, asked, uh, asked a question um, before the talk about what's really the developmental effects. And so there's not great data on use of really early use of um, cannabis, but there's thought based upon this adult data and, and data in, from teenagers that the younger that you use um, THC containing uh, uh, marijuana, that there will be cognitive impacts because neurotransmission is going to be altered and it's going to change the way normal brain um, development will occur. There's a number of smaller studies that have shown this. Um, there is, though, just to bring out the negative, that there are some studies that question this, but the totality of evidence now really suggests that there is cognitive impact on long term use of uh, cannabis disorder, which is worse if you start in teenage years. And the other big issue is the mental health issues associated with cannabis use. And so now there's really strong converging data to suggest that adolescent use increases the presentation of psychotic symptoms, schizophrenia, depression. There's actually a recent meta-analysis published um, earlier this year uh, from a European group that looked at you know, over 40 studies that um, follow the risk of of psychosis and depression in people with 
recreational use of mar marijuana and show that there's a clear increased risk of psychosis and depression and that those who have psychosis who've had chronic use have worse outcomes than those who don't have chronic use. Um, there's an old, slightly older review from 2016 that looked at over 60, uh, pooled over 60,000 patients and again showed an increased odds ratio of 3.9 for um, an association between cannabis use and psychosis. You know, of course, this is complex, this issue of self-treating, premorbid factors, genetic factors that are involved. Um, but again, the totality of evidence suggests that chronic um, use starting in adolescence is, increases your risk of mental health issues. And then also, as Dr. Jensen said, so I'm not going to uh, go into it with much detail, but there is a cannabis use disorder. One does get addicted, can get addicted to uh, marijuana. There can be um, uh, some level of withdrawal from it and the need for um, long-term cognitive treatment to prevent uh, relapse of chronic cannabis use um, of this. So with that, I'm going to, and then on the other hand, CBD and CBD containing compounds or, or pure CBD compounds, there's actually very little data for the long-term health risks. Most medical marijuana has very low CBD. So it's hard to extrapolate from those studies whether CBD itself would have long-term health risks. So there's very little data for um, its long-term use in, in humans. Um, <coughs> though it is a very safe, pure CBD is very safe, <coughs> that high doses, even up to actually people have reported up to over 1,000 or 2,000 milligrams a day does not have any um, central nervous system effects. Uh, there's this theoretical list because it can bind and suppress IL-8 and IL-10 expression that it can affect the immune system. But really, the, they're at the current time, pure CBD has very little long-term rest. Now that more people are using it and more people are using it um, chronically for just what ails them, um, it'll be interesting to see if this changes and it turns out that we start to see that there are longer term risks for um, chronic use of CBD. But in the patient population that I've been studying where we've had now some patients on it for five, six years, there doesn't seem to be any um, issues that are emerging in this relatively short time window. So what is the clinical data for medical marijuana? And so this is from a review uh, in 2016 that looked at a number of good quality studies um, in a variety of different disorders. And what I highlight here is that the number of good quality studies is very low. Um, those for pain um, are increasing, but really high quality studies for the use of medicinal marijuana, whether it's higher in THC, CBD, um, or isolated compounds is not uh, very well studied. Now, the caveat to that is this for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, there's independent studies for um, the, um, uh, I'm dropping the word, um, the um, extracted synthetic uh, THC that um, oncologists use frequently, for which there's actually good evidence that it works for uh, nausea and vomiting. So the most evidence that now exists is for epilepsy. And this is what I do. And so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the studies in epilepsy. So pre-2015, uh, when we started, or 2014, when we started um, the studies with GW Pharma, uh, there was um, a number of anecdotes reported in the literature that suggested that there was some efficacy for um, marijuana for um, seizures. There was some studies using a hemp-based project product with high CBD, which showed that patients could be seizure-free or have significant reduction in seizures. And others, studies like this AIMS 1985 study, where there was only 12 patients, where they saw no differences. And um, these studies suggested that potentially CBD versus um, using uh, a THC-based compound would be better. And this was reviewed in a Cochrane Reviews database study uh, uh, that was published in, I think, 2017. 
And then um, this company, GW Pharma, which had been working in the cannabis space uh, since the early 1990s, and actually was tr trying to get approved a, a product that was a mixture of 50-50 of THC and CBD by a nasal spray for spasticity and MS, and did get this approved in um, Europe and Canada, but it had not been approved uh, in the United States, but now it's actually back up for approval in the United States. Because of uh, this Charlotte Figge and um, Sanjay Gupta, they quickly pivoted to trying to do a real clinical trial for CBD in, um, in epilepsy. So they contacted uh, a number of pediatric neurologists around the country, and it started with five sites, where CHOP was one of the sites, where we used, uh, applied for an IND, a compassionate use IND, um, or expanded access program to treat kids with really severe epilepsy who had very little other options. And this program um, around the country, about 214 patients were enrolled. Uh, we were able to, with this paper, which was published in Lancet Neurology, there was 162 patients that um, got CBD. And we were able to look at the safety and tolerability of this product. Now, the GW product is extracted from the plant. It is highly purified CBD. It's about 99 point something percent pure CBD. Um, and then we were able to also look at efficacy. But again, this was an open label expanded access uh, um, trial. And what the trial was, uh, and here's the patients who were in the trial. So if you look at for safety analysis or efficacy analysis, it was about half males and females. The mean age was 10 years of age. Um, and there was a variety of different epilepsy syndromes that were included in this, including Gervais syndrome, which is what the patient that Sanjay Gupta reported on had, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, which is a, the other more common severe intractable epilepsy, as well as a variety of other different syndromes. And so what we did is we took a four-week baseline where we had the families uh, count seizures, and then we started CBD at five milligrams per kilogram per day, divided um, BID, and increased the dose up to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day over the first four weeks. And then the patient stayed on those dose for 12 weeks. At the end of that time, we could adjust anything that the patients wanted to. And again, this was an open label study. And this is looking, these are waterfall plots, which show those who got worse, as well as those who got better. And you see that the majority of patients got better, and even a number of patients became seizure-free. And this is looking at the change in monthly motor seizures. This is looking at the change in total seizures, and you see there's even a better response of total seizures. And when you look at different types of seizures, there were slightly different responses. Overall, there was a 38% reduction in all motor seizures. The median reduction of total seizures was 34.6% but a better response in Gervais patients than in LGS patients. And what's interesting is this was an open label study. And when we did this study, you know, the question was, well, was this just placebo effect? So many of these families wanted to get on CBD. They had heard all these anecdotes and was this really just gonna be a placebo effect? And so I was very skeptical when we moved forward with the placebo controlled trials that uh, GB, uh, GW Pharma um, sponsored. And they actually sponsored four um, uh, placebo-controlled trials, two for Dravet syndrome, two for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So one of the other issues besides placebo effect that we were very concerned about is that CBD is actually a potent inhibitor of the CYP3A4 and 2C19 uh, isoenzymes. So CBD is going to um, modulate the activity of, or the, the amounts of other um, anti-epileptic drugs that we usually use to treat um, these patients. And particularly, clobazam, which is also known as ONFI, is used frequently in patients with Dravet and LGS. And it turns out that um, CBD blocks the metabolism of clobazam so that you get increased clobazam levels. So one of the questions was, does CBD not actually work on its own, but does it work by blocking um, the metabolism so that you just have higher levels of clobazam? And 
if you looked at the patients on clobazam versus not on clobazam, there was a, a significant difference of those who responded. But there were patients who responded, uh, a number of patients who responded without clobazam too. And the other drug that there's an interaction with is valproate or uh, Depakote, and this is a drug we use frequently in this population as well. And again, there was a difference in response in these two drugs. So we performed a um, regression analysis and showed that there was, if you adjust for age, sex, um, and CBD dose, that clobazam was independent predictor of response to, um, to uh, CBD. Now, subsequent work has shown that that, that that has held up and that their group with clobazam and CBD tends to do better than CBD alone, but it does not seem to be due to an increase in the level. And there's now been other work that have shown that there may be synergistic actions at the synapse level between these two uh, compounds and that it's not a pharmacokinetic, um, sorry, but why, um, response. And then what were the adverse events? You know, this was an open label study. So the real main thing we were looking at was adverse events. And we saw that there was, um, uh, fatigue and um, somnolence, decreased appetite, decreased um, diarrhea, increased appetite. Now the, the diarrhea and the decreased appetite, we mostly attribute it to the fact that the CBD is, um, is uh, placed in an oil. So this was given as an oil. And some of these kids were taking eight to 10 uh, mLs of sesame oil twice a day. And you can imagine that if any of who, you who were listening took eight mLs of sesame oil, your stools would become loose. So we don't think this is actually directly due to CBD, but rather what the carrier was for this. And there were a bunch of um, severe adverse events, including status epilepticus. And again, the question was, were some patients being made worse from this? Or in this population where these children had frequent status epi epilepticus anyway, this was just the normal um, uh, uh, ebb and flow of seizures in this severe population. So after our expanded access program, GW started uh, these phase three trials. And like I said, there were four published, uh, four done. They've all been published now. And what I'm gonna do is just quickly pick out one of them. And this is one of the lennox Gusto phase three trials, which was published in The Lancet. And it um, randomized uh, screened 200 patients, randomized 171 into CBD versus placebo. Um, uh, there were more withdrawn from the CBD group. And then they did an analysis of the, those who uh, finished and did an intention to treat analysis of all patients who entered into the study. Here is the characteristics of those patients. And to get to the punchline here, so CBD was effective compared to placebo. Um, the numbers, the efficacy rate, so the median reduction in seizures of 41% or 45% in those last four weeks was actually remarkably similar to our open label study data. So our uh, concern that all of the response was due to placebo effect was um, not true and that these uh, CBD actually had a statistically significant response um, where only 14% of, there was only a 14% reduction in seizures in the uh, placebo group with a 41 to 45% reduction. And then if you ask families overall how they thought they did, there was a significant improvement in quality of life um, or uh, of caregiver impression of change with many more saying that they were much improved or uh, uh, very much improved or slightly improved in the CBD group versus placebo. So strong evidence that uh, CBD uh, worked and all four studies remarkably had the same results. So it was very consistent results um, for the effect of CBD in these uh, severe pediatric epilepsies. The adverse events were similar to what we talked about in the open label study um, with diarrhea uh, and, and um, being tired. Now, this is, I'm having trouble pronouncing that word, and this is, uh, but it was higher in the CBD group than the placebo group, saying that maybe there is a slight effect in, of the CBD itself though other studies have, this has not really bared out. So that's the data. 
for epilepsy. And the other um, use that I, as a child neurologist, get asked a lot about is for behavior and autism. And, um, you know, there's a lot of anecdotes on Facebook uh, groups, news stories about how CBD can be very effective for autism. There actually has now been only one published study, which was published in the Frontiers of Pharmacology in 2019, which looked at oral cannabidiol use for autism spectrum disorders um, to treat uh, comorbid symptoms. And this was a study of 53 children. It was also an open label study. Um, it had children treated for 66 days. And there was improvement by parental report in self-injury, in hyperactivity, in sleep problems, and in anxiety. And to note that one of the things that we, um, a lot of parents reported in our epilepsy studies is that their uh, children's sleep improved significantly on um, CBD. So again, this is an open label study. The adverse events were the same that we see uh, in the epilepsy studies well. So there's really consistency in um, the possible adverse events that one has to uh, look for. Their same group, this is an Israeli group who did this study, are actually now in the midst of a placebo-controlled trial with a uh, product from one of the Israeli um, medical cannabis companies where it's a, a GMP-produced high CBD extracted from the plant um, trial that they've done. There also has been, and I don't think I have it here, but I will just say it, a study, um, a small study of in behavior in Fragile X with a synthetic CBD out of a company that's based out of um, Westchester, Pennsylvania, um, which has shown a positive sign in this small study for behavior in patients with Fragile X syndrome. And they're moving on to a larger open, uh, a larger placebo controlled study as well. Now there's a lot more data for uh, pain. Most of the studies are uh, pain studies. Um, what's interesting is that if you looked at the state of Colorado, when they started to open up for medicinal marijuana use, 94% um, of the people who came into their dispensaries, pain was the main um, symptom that they complained about. Um, and the vast majority of those were men in their 30s to 50s complaining of chronic pain as, a, as their medicinal use for medical marijuana. And so it's a little suspicious that that group um, had that use. Um, there are a number of reviews of the primary literature. Um, and basically, uh, the overall data suggests that there are there is evidence that um, CBD or CBD and THC or combinations of these has an improvement in uh, pain and can be used to treat pain, though not all the studies have been uh, positive in that regard. Um, for nausea and vomiting, like I said, there's a number of studies that have looked at this. Um, and generally, uh, um, dronabinol or nabilone, which are the uh, synthetic THCs, were, ha already have FDA approval for the use of chemotherapy-associated nausea and vomiting, um, and that there is a significant response um, uh, to THC and THC with CBD uh, for these symptoms. But the data for mixtures from plants or uh, those on plant products is much less than the synthetic cannabinoids uh, that exist. Um, there's a number of studies for spasticity, particularly in MS, though also for uh, spasticity due to spinal cord injury. And this is the product that I was talking about earlier, Sabitex, which is this 50-50 product that GW Pharma um, has studied, and that they were able to show that um, there was uh, a reduction in spasticity and pain in these populations. What's interesting uh, um, that the main study that uh, GW um, did to look for spasticity, it didn't hit its primary endpoint, but it was a, and that was due to the very, very high placebo um, rate that they found in the study. 
they did an interesting secondary endpoint, which was they randomized people coming off versus staying on. And in their secondary endpoint, there was a statistically significant difference for improvement in spasticity. Um, and that secondary endpoint um, with other uh, smaller studies that they done did uh, allowed approval for the SAV attacks in Europe and Canada. Like I said, the US is now reassessing some of this data to see if there would be approval for uh, SAV attacks for specificity MS in the US. There is a number of other conditions um, that there are some data for, and I'm not going to go uh, into this in any detail now because these are all really small um, studies with significant limitations across the board, and more research is need to be done in all of these to really see if there's um, indications for this. And across all these studies, um, some of the same uh, side effects uh, emerge that uh, with THC containing compounds, you get dizziness, dry mouth, uh, CBD compounds, uh, which are oil based or, or eaten, you get nausea, um, tiredness, uh, CBD containing compounds, obviously, you get some level of euphoria, and more the CBD, uh, the diarrhea. So these are consistent across all of these studies. And one of the other main things to note is if families are going to get um, products from dispensaries that these, you know, marijuana interacts with the SIP system so that it will interfere with other drugs. So it's really important to note from a prescriber or a recommender perspective that you have to think about drug-drug interactions when you think about using um, uh, or suggesting a medicinal marijuana because it will interact with other drugs. So you have to be very careful um, when one's, one does that. And so, you know, almost most states in the United States now have laws. This was a slide from Third Way, which is a think tank um, about oops, using uh, medicinal marijuana. Um, and Pennsylvania has a medical marijuana law. And there's a number of states that have recreational as well as medical marijuana laws as well. The state laws vary about the disorders that can be treated. They vary about what the formulations they allow and the oversight in the production of these formulations. And they vary in terms of how strict they are in um, giving out medical marijuana cards. Um, and Pennsylvania is actually the only state that has a research program built into its medical marijuana laws. And that research program is really just now getting off the ground after uh, a number of lawsuits to try to block it as some of the dispensaries didn't want academic centers to get involved and other dispensaries to get licenses to do research. Um, all those lawsuits have been settled and the research component of the state laws are moving forward. And this is really exciting because a lot of the lack of data of these, of these artisanal preparations or dispensary preparations will now be, uh, hopefully be clarified as um, different uh, Pennsylvania institutions start to do high quality studies on these products. So Pennsylvania passed the medical marijuana law, it was Title X in 2017. It allows cannabis use for 18 conditions. It was originally just edibles, tinctures, and oils, um, but now plant material can be sold. And I need to update this, but the state component just recently, well, recently, this was like last fall, was um, allowed to move forward. These are the diagnoses that um, can be uh, um, allowed. And I highlighted in red some of the ones um, that I've already talked about here, particularly um, the epilepsy and seizures. Interestingly, you know, epilepsy and seizures are twice on this list and they are the same thing. So someone didn't uh, fully think this through. Doctors for the state of Pennsylvania must register with the state. You have to take, uh, pay a fee and require a four hour training course in order to be able to, be, uh, to recommend the use of medical marijuana. Um, and you don't prescribe it, you give the family or the, the patient a recommendation. They need to register for a medical marijuana card. And once they have their card and a recommendation, they can go to a state dispensary uh, where the person um, behind the counter recommends what product to give to uh, the individual who's coming in. And obviously the people who are doing this are not very well trained um, individuals. And what's one of the problems with this non-medical 
process that exists for dispensing marijuana from a, a, for a medical use. So in conclusion, I'm running out of time, uh, the cannabis contains a number of compounds that have potential therapeutic applications. The mechanism of action is not fully known, though for THC, it's through the endocannabinoid system. Through CBD, it might be through this GPR55 system. There are long-term health uh, related issues for chronic use of THC containing um, uh, marijuana. And there's a data does exist for a number of health benefits, but there are a number of um, limitations to these studies and a number of challenges in continuing to move these studies forward, which really needs to be done. And one of the big challenges is now that this is available from uh, across most states, why would a company want to do a study if someone can just go to a dispensary to get the product? And is there any motivation for study companies to continue to do um, studies so that physicians really have good quality data in order to make um, sound clinical choices for their patients. Some of the future questions, you know, pharmaceutical, so extracting compounds or synthesizing, these compounds are actually fairly um, easy to synthesize. So synthesizing compounds versus getting it from the plant versus using whole plant, are there benefits for whole plant um, versus isolates? Is there differences between synthetic and natural-based CBD? And we need detailed studies on each of these conditions to know, really know what the side effect um, profile is for any given condition and know if there is efficacy for that condition. So a lot of work needs to happen before we move forward. And with that, I will end um, and take any questions. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Marsh. That was really wonderful. And we, we are really at the, the official end of the program, but um, if people are willing to stay on and if you're willing to be on for just a few more minutes yeah. in case some questions come in, great. Um, I don't see any questions coming in and we have nearly 100 people on with us. So if you, if you have a question, please submit it right away. Um, I would like to ask you, because I know that we have a lot of behavioral health professionals on this program um, who are working with young people, when you, how do you feel about the term medical marijuana in general? And what kind of language do you use to help a family that you're working with their child to understand the distinction? If there's any language you can share with our participants to help them with that. Yeah, that, that's a good um, question. And, you know, I, I think the, you know, when I talk to families about medical marijuana, I talk about, I try to talk about, you know, where we have, um, some information about its side effect profile and its efficacy, and that what particular um, aspect of marijuana, whether it's THC containing, CBD containing, um, is has some um, potential for for working and is worth the potential risks of of doing so. And so, and then I try to really distinguish that from just the recreational marijuana, street marijuana, pot, whatever that people um, are apt to try to get and use. And I really focus on the production, the quality, and that when you're getting street-based drugs, you really don't know what you're getting. And so that there's a risk of doing those things. I actually haven't, had, haven't thought that much about and don't have great terms to distinguish it. So I really try to focus on um, medicinal marijuana and keep the word medicinal in it versus, you know, recreational use of pot and try to use different terms to separate them out. But um, it's something that, you know, coming up with a better term to distinguish the two is needed. And as I think, you know, as we get more and more information about clinical uses, people will talk about potentially products. And now in the epilepsy space, you know, we talk about Epidiolex, even though, you know, you shouldn't really use the, the um, brand names. In this case, we actually like to use the brand name because it, establishes it as a prescription drug or a prescription product versus just CBD, which you can get at a dispensary and over the counter. Right, right, an FDA approved product versus, right. Um, and I know that a number, I think there's some, some confusion as well. And when, if you visit some of the dispensary sites, you can see the potencies, you know, and, they, and it's very, very evident that they're predominantly high potency THC, low potency T CBD, low, low uh, levels of, of CBD. Um, so I think that's where a lot of this can be 
very confusing for folks, you know, and I'm curious too about the CBD that's being sold everywhere under the sun, topical things and so forth. Um, even for the, for the orally, the tinctures and things like that, is there any regulation of these, these? No, that's, it's a great point. And I, and I didn't, you know, I usually do bring it up and I forgot to bring it up is that um, the ones that are being sold like at CVS and just on over the internet and where you can get these things anywhere, there's zero regulation of. And there was actually an article uh, published in JAMA a year and a half ago now, maybe two years ago, which um, uh, tested like 20 something of these products that were found on the internet and almost none had said, said had what they said was in it. Um, some which said there was no THC actually had THC in it. Some which said there was you know, a lot of CBD, there was no CBD in it. There were some that said there was X amount of CBD and there was more CBD than they said in it. So they're, they, the, the, the quality of these um, products that you can get at CVS or you know, just not at a dispensary is very poor. In Pennsylvania, the dispensaries actually have to track the quality of their product from plant to extraction to when it's bottled. So there's a number of steps where the state requires them to submit documentation of what's in the product. Um, so it's better than most states. Pennsylvania has the kind of one of the strictest um, tracking of product than most other states. Unfortunately, um, these companies can use their own testing labs. So you know you can imagine there's some uh, naughtiness that potentially goes on there. Um, but one of the other issues that's coming into play is that there's now more national players who are getting licenses to produce across states. And these bigger players have, you know, they're, they're acting like almost pharmaceutical companies. They are doing this with GMP. They're really getting their processes down. So they're starting to become more reliable sources of, of um, product, whether it's high in THC or, or pure CBD. So those would be, if you're gonna steer someone to one, to a dispensary, to some of these companies that are, have more of a national presence because they actually have a lot more experience um, and of quality control and in doing this. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I wanna respect everyone's time, so we will wrap up. I'm very curious about you. It's the first time that I heard the Pennsylvania is the first state to research, have a research program. So um, I might be contacting you for more information about that because I find that really interesting. Um, it is an opportunity. Why not, right? So that's wonderful that they're taking advantage of that. So, um, and Dr. Jensen, I think that you're still on with us as well? Yep, still here. Great. Any did, final did thoughts did. From, from either of you? Just so Eric, Eric answered all those questions uh, perfectly, as he always does. So nothing else for me on that topic. Great. Right. Well, thank you both so very much. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, we do have a survey that comes up at the end of this program. So if you'll please give us your feedback, that is not the same as the evaluation that you would take after tomorrow's program for your continuing in or Act 48 credits. Um, just a reminder that tomorrow we will be back here same time, same station sort of, different login um, with Dr. Garbally from Care and Treatment Center. I know that Dr. Marsh briefly touched on um, the addictive potential of THC, but he is gonna be talking specifically about that. They do treat the adolescent population as well as adults. And he will be talking about what they're seeing um, in terms of cannabis use disorder um, and a lot of the things that go along with that. So. Thank you both so very, very much. Um, and uh, Dr. Marsh, if you're willing to share your PowerPoint, I will convert it to a PDF and include that along with the recording of this. I know lots of folks want to make sure they have access to all that great research you guys have done and shared with us all. So many, many thanks and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone.